Hi, welcome to The Relationship Restaurant, where we talk about all things to get heart-healthy communication. This is Poppy and Jeff Spencer, your Relationship Restaurant hosts. And we're so excited to bring today a topic that we've been talking about round and round many times in our counseling, in our everyday lives, and certainly around holidays, birthdays, and anniversaries, special occasions. And that one word is expectations. What do we expect when expectations aren't set or met? Mm -hmm. You know, and some of those things are really kind of dicey. Now, today happens to be our anniversary. And as of this recording, as of this recording, when we're doing it, uh, one of the things that uh, Poppy and I often look back at is how we got in trouble all those years ago because of expectations not being met and communications not being clearly spoken and assumptions made and those are all the things that really tangle up relationships we were 21 year old college sweethearts and didn't know that we had a really super good thing going and we got split up well i think we did but we just didn't at that immature age didn't think about talking about what the future could and should be or might it just even to connect and get together, not not. And I didn't know you had expectations for me to talk about that. Right. And so I felt like kind of a placeholder in that time back in college, which we'll talk a little bit about later. But being a placeholder, being a filler in a relationship, if anybody feels that way, they need to express that and communicate that to their partner. But luckily, 32 years later, with no contact, We got married eight years ago today. So excited. And when I placed that call to Poppy, when I looked for Poppy, I had no expectations of what could be. I was simply just curious what had happened to this wonderful gal that I dated in college and was madly in love with back then. And little did I know that in my wildest dreams that she had hoped and had expectations of trying to find me again. Yes, but I even gave up on those expectations. So what you're saying is, and what we are saying is, is that expectations and not having them can really be a big bonus thing for you. All right, so we just passed, this is the month of February, we just passed Valentine's Day. And I'm going to tell you what we did on Valentine's Day. Several days before, we had commitments out of town business-wise for two weeks, And leading up to Valentine's Day, my partner, my spouse, my loved one, my soulmate person said, I'm feeling really anxious about something. And if you followed us enough, you know about our emotional clock that we developed and trademarked. And it's a communication tool that we use that has 12 emotional settings on an analog clock. And two o'clock is anxiety. He said, I'm feeling anxious about something. And I want to share this with you. And I'm not sure how to say it. These are all good things that we say to all of our clients that we work with. And I said, sure, what is it? You know, I drop everything, put down the phone. Valentine's Day is coming. and I'm nervous. We haven't had any opportunities to plan or do anything. And I know we're going to be really busy with it. And and I'm just, I'm I'm not sure what to do or say about this because we're really not going to be able to go out to dinner or anything. And I haven't any chance to get anything gift-wise for you. What do you want to do about Valentine's Day? And because we were both out of town on business on Valentine's Day and night and knew we'd be fried by, you know, 7 o'clock on Thursday night, Valentine's Day, I said, let's just not make a big deal about it. I know that other people, 98% of Western America makes... (laughs) <laughs> makes a big deal about it. Western civilization. Western civilization. All of America. All of America. But I'm okay with it. And I put a little caveat this year, just because we had a lot of stuff going on. And we also knew that we have our anniversaries just five days later. Right. And so the cool thing about that was that we were able to tap into our knowledge of our love languages Okay, my love language is, my primary one is acts of service. As is mine. So Jeff gets off like really easy. I don't need flowers and gifts and all that stuff. That's not a primary thing. Acts of service, doing little things here and there and without even being asked. Those are the things that I cherish and worship. And And so, but anyway, so getting back to 
Valentine's Day, that is not the case for many people. Often that conversation never comes up and one party or the other is hoping that the other will, you know, secretly make a reservation at a restaurant, which is good luck in any restaurant in America, (laughs) trying to get a reservation at the last minute, or that they will have ordered flowers or the box of candy and all of those things. You know, it's important that you communicate this ahead of time. What are your expectations for Valentine's Day, for your birthday, for your anniversary, for Christmas, for Hanukkah, for whatever holiday it is, for somebody's wedding? What are those expectations? It's important to have those yeah, We We witnessed uh, kind of a train wreck, uh, a couple of friends of ours, uh, over Valentine's Day where the date was coming up and uh, the gentleman uh, asked the, the, the lady... The night if, before. The night, uh, the night, two, nights two nights before. Two nights before, I think it was two nights. What would you like to do uh, about Valentine's? Do you want to go out to dinner at our favorite restaurant? And of course they said, well, I'm sure the restaurant is already booked solid. It's a very popular restaurant. And I'm sure with Valentine's, they're, they're book sold. So that's probably not going to happen. So she said, you know what? I want to cook. I want to make something in the kitchen. I'll make one of our favorite meals. Why don't you come Just come over to my place. Just come over to my place. They were not living together. And he says, that sounds great. I'll sounds just plan great. on doing that. So the next day, Wednesday, they are talking on the phone about making plans about something for two weeks out. And the woman says, I'll see you at six o'clock tonight. Oh, he's like, oh, oh it's six o'clock on tomorrow on, on tomorrow for Valentine's. Oh, Day. gosh, I, I just maybe I forgot to tell you, I've realized I had some tickets. Those uh, hockey tickets. I had some very, you know, I've been, I've, I bought these a long time ago. This is a big game. Well, I'm going to go with one of my friends. And oh, gosh, I'm sorry. I have, I have to do this hockey game, so I'm not going to be able to make it. So the woman was really upset. Well, let's just call her Carly. Carly was really upset quickly got off the phone, didn't hang up on him or anything. And within an hour, there were 12 long stem roses at her door saying happy Valentine's and Day. He thought that would do it. He thought that would cover it, that he all he had to do was send those dozen roses and he'd be uh, out of the doghouse. But what he didn't do was find out what Carly's primary love language was. And so, her, her primary love language was... Quality time. Quality time. Right. And so this was a huge thing to her that she was kind of, air quote, dumped on Valentine's Day. And she told the florist to take the flowers back, which was a really big move on her part. And he was uh, very upset that these, uh, when he discovered that these roses had not been accepted. And she also, I think, placed a call and kind of explained that, hey, you know, I'm sorry that yeah, I really don't want them if, I, if I'm not going to be seeing you. If I'm not going to be seeing you. So the long and the short of it is people have expectations about things. Had they communicated ahead of time, you know, what should he have done? Should he have given this ticket to somebody else? He absolutely. If he would have really thought through this process, he would have said, you know what? I'd already made a commitment to this person I have a longstanding, very good relationship with. And this is Valentine's Day. And even though it's no big deal to me. This is probably a big deal to her. It's usually a bigger deal to the, the ladies than it is the gentlemen. And so he should have said, you know, somebody else needs to take this ticket and I'm just going to take a buy on that one. And I'm going to make sure I go see this loved one of mine and spend a romantic Valentine's dinner with her as I'd already committed to. And the other thing that would be really helpful, if Jeff and I are a Myers-Briggs certified if he knew her Myers-Briggs type, he is a, what we call a, a perceiver. A, that's the last letter of the of the four letter designation. And perceivers tend to prefer to make decisions kind of at the last minute. Kind of on the fly. Kind of being spontaneous. His girlfriend, however, is a judger. She has a very clear preference for judging, which means she likes commitments set in stone. Once something's made, it's done. The planning ahead is just not in his, on his radar. And that really trips them up. So this is not the first time that something like this has happened. Mm-hmm. So what can someone do for that? They can know. Hey, that, he can try to learn from his things and right. not, not repeat the same mistake over and over. Right. 
And they could certainly understand each other's love language. Right. They could find out. And by the way, the love languages are from Dr. Gary Chapman, who was on a previous podcast here on the Relationship Restaurant. And the five love languages are words of affirmation, acts of service. Quality time. Quality time. Physical touch. Physical touch and gift giving. Mm -hmm. So I think our friend whose name is... Henry. We'll, we'll just call him Henry. His probably primary love language is either gift giving or words of affirmation. I would definitely say words of affirmation knowing Henry. All right. And maybe the secondary is gift giving. Mm -hmm. So he just made that assumption, made that expectation that giving her of the flowers would kind of just like absolve him of all responsibility and keeping that commitment. So William Shakespeare says, expectation is the root of all heartache. Which is so true. That is what, exactly what tripped you and I up. Your expectations that I would figure out that you wanted me to talk about a future. I didn't have the same thoughts in my 21-year-old immature guy brain. Yes. And, and so, okay, so we're married. We each come to the table with lots of life experiences growing up in our families. What about expectations that siblings have growing up with a two-parent household, a one-parent household, a grandparent raising the children? You know, sometimes siblings that grow up in the family, there will be a familial expectation, if you will, that all of the siblings will be alike because they came from the same mother and father or even in a blended family. Because you're part of this family, it's just assumed and expected that you will share the exact same values that we have. And that is not the case. That is not the case. So, you know, you'll hear parents like, why can't you be more like your brother or your sister? Which is really... It's a very tough sentence to put on any sibling. Yes. The child. When they're yes. trying to be their own person. And the expectation of the parent is to say, to be like this other child. Right. And there's also expectations that we put on our partners. And oftentimes we project our own expectations of ourselves. Sometimes we have high expectations for ourselves that aren't met. And when they're not met, we transfer that anger and resentment onto our partners. And this is an area we see so many couples get in trouble. And it just boils down to communicating these expectations this happens to so many guys where they just feel like they got hit by a train, having no idea there were expectations that, that they had not met. And so, so many times we'll be talking to, to couples and it's often the ladies will be asking me, you know, do, do guys think about these things? Do guys consider this? And my typical answer is no, they don't. They, if you have something you want to have, an expectation you'd like to have met, you need to clearly articulate and share your thoughts, share your desires share your expectations, and with that, then they have a very good chance of taking care of meeting those expectations. You know, we come into these relationships, you know, whether you're 18 or 38 or 58, however old you are, you still bring in those messages, those experiences, those values that you had. And I remember one of the things that I asked somebody a long time ago I was on a date with, one of the first things I asked on the very first date, which was pretty wild, was, do you love and respect your mother? Okay, so this was important to me. Do you know why? Because if they love their mother, they'll, uh, they'll be respectful to you as of well. Of me, right. Mm -hmm. Because I had been in a relationship where I did not feel respected mm -hmm. as a woman, as a partner. And so that was paramount to me. It's like... Do you love and respect your mother? Of course, the guy said yes. And I don't know whether he did or not, but he said yes. He probably does. I think historically, we look back and I think the answer was probably not really. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. You know, so those are the things that we have. And then what other messages do you think you learned in growing up or even in adult life, earlier adult life that might have influenced the way you enter into a marriage now? Or well, we've seen it with our clients. I know we all have expectations of what life is supposed to be doing. I can, I've, Poppy and I have had this conversation uh, when I was a, a very young guy, uh, not too long out of college, just working. I was dating a young gal and I was at that age 
where expectations of society uh, were, well, this is about the time that you should be considering marriage and starting a family. So with that in mind, with that expectation that society had set, I married this young lady, even though probably in my heart of hearts, I knew this wasn't the best fit for me. But I thought I could make this work and make changes that could uh, adapt to making us both work better together. So those expectations that I'd placed on myself that society had set had uh, set me on a, a path that didn't work very well. But you learn and you grow. Sure. You know, we always learn and we grow from those. And so often we override that intuitive gut instinct that places a tiny, even little red flag out in our path. And we kind of step around it and we kind of ignore it. And we that's say, common for anybody. Try not to ignore those red flags. If you see them, pick them up and look at them very carefully because those are the things that can often come back to derail and, and often destroy good relationships. So we talked about you know expectations around holidays and things like that and birthdays and special events. I used to do this with my children because birthdays are really important in my family. So I have an expectation that we will make a big to-do about someone's birthday in our family. And when I, in turn, wanted my children when they were younger to acknowledge my birthday, I would do things like they would come in the house from playing outside or something, and they might be carrying something in a backpack or a box. And I said, oh, should I close my eyes? I don't want to see that. Because <laughs> there might be something in there for me for my birthday in two weeks. And so it was just these little obnoxious, subtle reminders to them. And, you know, but of they course, got the there, message. Was, there was never anything in the backpack that they had Yeah, right. Gotten. But my kids always came through for me and they still do. And they're wonderful. For weddings, expectations, like how should I dress for the wedding? You know, you can't just assume that your partner, let's say you're bringing someone to the family Thanksgiving or the family wedding, don't assume that your partner is going to know how to dress. Yes, because you might have men and women both. Grandmother, mother who expects a certain level of decorum that you should be wearing a dress shirt and uh, collared shirts. And there's certain things that are just expectations by some families. And for ladies, it's like, yeah, that tank top dress, even though it looks really hot on you, I I just, I'm not sure it's going to be great for the church wedding that we're going to or the synagogue. And so those kinds of things could be gently shared and you could do like a cover letter. We always talk about like what you should say ahead of time is, You know, I'm not, this is something that's really important to my family because I love my family and grandma is really old fashioned and she expects us to be in kind of formal attire. To me, I could care less what you wear, but out of respect for my family, would you mind putting on a coat and tie? Would you mind putting on a a blazer over your sundress, your halter dress? You know, it's that kind of thing to presented that way. The other thing that we want to talk about are expectations around health. So this was something that came up with several of our clients that we had where somebody had like a broken arm and they had to go to the ER and the partner basically said, you know, well, you know, just keep me posted on your update. Well, she was crushed. I mean, she was crushed that it was like, you're not going to come to the hospital. You're not going to come sit Be with at my me. bedside. You're not going to, you know, do that. And we had another client where she, they had their first child and he brought her home from the hospital after having a 24 hour labor. It was ridiculous and dropped her off, left the car running and said, yeah, I have to go. Even though he worked out of the home, he said, yeah, I told a friend I'd meet up with him later. And the woman, the new mother, was absolutely crushed. This is her first baby, and there was, like, no time to connect with the three of them at home. And so, you know. And she was needing help physically. And she needed help physically and, you know, unpacking everything. And, you know, this was in Chicago, I think. And so it was winter time. It was just this abrupt awakening awareness that both of these two scenarios had. Where she had an absolute expectation that, of course, he would be home. Well, at least of, for a little while. Of course, he'd be helping. Not leaving the car running and said, see ya. You know? <laughs> so share these things with your partners and your family members and your loved ones 
to say, you know, I have an expectation that, and then you fill in the blank. And if you are nervous that the person on the other end of the receiving might become angry or agitated or upset with you, say that. Just say, I'm just not sure how to approach this because I'm afraid that you will be offended and that's not my intention at all. But I want to share with you that I'm concerned about this. I have this expectation that I want you by my side. You know, we often see this with couples getting married. The proverbial bachelor party. The bachelor party is like, where are you going? When are you coming home? Are there strippers there? What are these expectations? Please talk about that with your bride-to-be. Absolutely. And uh, you know, not to say that the guys aren't allowed to go out and have a good time, but set the level of expectation. I promise that I'm, I'm going to be behaving. We'll be home at a reasonable hour. I'm not going to be yeah. all hung over for the wedding. And you know, whatever the expectations right. need to be that uh, right. to put both parties at ease, make yeah. sure you set those. After the rehearsal, if there's a time then the bride goes to bed early, is the groom going to go to bed as early too? Or is the groom going to say, hey, I want to catch up with all my buddies I haven't seen in a long time. And then the groom stumbles into the altar uh, an hour of sleep, you know. So those are all expectations. So the other one around is about money. Money. This was, again, another area where people get in big, big trouble because they do not discuss and do not share the same expectations of who's paying what bills, how do we save, uh, you know, all the different things that are that uh, become tripwires. So many relationships when money strategies are not understood and agreed to. I know, Pops, we had a... Oh, we had Anna, Anna and Will Chase. Right, we had were, them. They were awesome. And all, they just uh, recently got married, I believe. But yeah. they, they had a, did a great thing. They had actually a date, a money date where they a sat... Budget a date. budget date. where they sat and Once talked, a month. Talked about budgets, talked about... This is before they were fully committed, married. This is they just, weren't even engaged. They weren't even engaged. So you can do this without even being engaged. And you set the tone for such a really healthy, communicative relationship when you do that. Mm-hmm. And I like their budget day. Do you remember the specifics about it? Not uh, they had not they, in great depth, but they I know they talked about what they'd spent. Uh, were they within the budget if they'd gone uh, over or out of the budget explaining the reasons why, not having judgments about it, but just simply saying, you know, whoops, I had a bill that I wasn't expecting, uh, you know, something that I forgot about. And it, was, it wasn't something that they beat each other up about, but they simply they made clear and they made uh, exceptions for it in the next budget. And that was the part that really touched me a lot, because oftentimes we can have a lot of shame and guilt around money and spending. And so they started from the very first time they met and they said, we will have no judgments about the other. There's not going to be any blame. There's not going to be any shaming. We are going to just accept the numbers and then we're going to work creatively together to problem solve how to, you know, wiggle room our budget to make sure that next month that we're in the black. Mm-hmm. We've seen people where the wife is, is being, uh, chastised by the husband because you spent money on what you did you bought what and these are things that uh, i'm sure uh, in case of i know one from one of our friends the wife thought she would buy things that were very reasonable and very very acceptable but the the husband shamed her and made her feel terrible about things that she thought were quite reasonable right and we've been working with couples all along and we often come back to money what we try and make our couples see is that You know, typically if a woman wants to enhance the home with paint and fabrics and upholstery and furniture and wall art, the man in this particular one that we're thinking of doesn't really care, but he knows it's important to her. And we try and make her see that this is an act of love that he is giving to her. He's like, you know what? I don't really need all this stuff, but you like it. And because I love you. I am giving you that. And I think it's really important that partners acknowledge that when the other one is saying, hey, I give you this. I could care less. I just want a couch and a coffee table and a TV. That's all I care about. It's just important that they Mm -hmm. recognize that when the partner. And again, it's communicating your feelings about it, that uh, I know this is important to you. So that's wonderful. And I'm okay with that. Okay. And so the last one is just the living You know, we just sort of touch on that right now, but just expectations around living. If you live together with your partner, 
What are some expectations that should be verbalized? First of all, it probably goes right to things budget-wise. You know, who's paying for what? Okay. And not making the assumptions that, uh, you know, if one party's paying these things, have been paying them, don't make the assumptions that that person should always continue to pay them. Discuss those things. And the expectations might change over time, too. Where, say, one person's paying the rent and the utilities, and the other person, say, buying groceries. You might say, you know, I think you're probably paying a lot more than me. I don't feel good about this, that you're paying more. I'd like to contribute more. It's always important to just have those communications, to share and find out what each other's expectations are, because you'll only get in trouble when there are expectations and you don't communicate them and you don't you fail to meet them. That's when you get in trouble. Right. And the flip side of that is that resentment sleeps in, sure. sleeps in right? Yes. If somebody says, hey, I'm paying two thirds of everything here and you're paying one third, you can again, you can adapt this budget date. And by the way, that budget day is completely about no drinking, no anything else. It's just strictly spreadsheets and computers and writing down with pen yeah, and paper. They don't do it over a glass of wine. You make no. sure that they're all both very clear minds. And, uh, and It's a meeting. It's, mm-hmm. a, it's, it's just a meeting. And then afterwards, yeah, absolutely. Go ahead and celebrate and, and do that. So the last thing that we wanted to talk about were something that you may have heard before about a placeholder relationship. If you think you might be in one. And that this is a relationship where it's probably not going anywhere. And the idea of a placeholder, it's just you're dating someone and it just, it's holding a a place and you're just, you're, you have someone to have a date with, you have someone to have dinner with, you have someone to, to be with, but you're not really even your whole part of hearts committed to it. And this can happen with somebody who is very nice, you're very comfortable with them, but you're not really pushing the envelope on like passion and love and all that. And you might be jaded. You might think, you know what? Love is, you know, I don't believe in soulmate stuff. I don't believe in destiny. I don't believe that love is really all it's cracked up to be. I I don't believe love is for me. And we set very low expectations and settle, that's where you typically you again get into trouble because your relationship will never meet the real expectations that you truly have. Especially if the other person has higher expectations. Of course. And so one person might hang on to the relationship, even though they know intuitively that the other one is just not that into them. Mm-hmm. And they, they also believe that, wait a minute, maybe if I jump through some more hoops here, that that person will come around. And sadly, that just isn't the case. The other experience that we've had working with couples... Sometimes that person wants a marriage and uh, the other one wants that uh, their word is good enough that they're committed. And you know, that expectation, on what, what is marriage a, a critical aspect to a relationship? Do you have to be married? And I know for Poppy and I, we, we both are very big proponents of marriage. We believe in marriage. And I'll explain why I think it's important, because when you commit to someone, I like to commit with my whole heart, my whole soul. And so I believe the the opportunity for marriage is where you have, you can very publicly show that you are all in, that you want the blessings of all of your friends, all of your family, and according to your faith, you are God, you want all those things on board, making sure that you show the person you're committing to that you are all in and there's no question that this is something you want the rest of your life and make it the very best you possibly can. I feel the same way. I like having that physical commitment of a piece of paper and a court document. I like having the spiritual commitment and the personal commitment that I am now, you know, is that wonderful article that we read that went viral many, many years ago about the man who said, marriage is not for me. It was such a startling title that when you read it, he said, it's all about the other person. Mm -hmm. Marriage is not about me, for me. It's about that person. And I think so many, especially young people, never really think that way or rarely think that way. They think about what's this person going to do for me? Is this the right person for me? 
And you typically are, if you're looking at it in a very selfish light, it's a very shallow way to go into the relationship. Uh, the commitment is always to the other person. And if you're doing all you can to give and love that person and they're doing the same thing back to you, it is a pretty wonderful way to have a marriage and a relationship. Right. One of the things that we wanted to share with you is an, the author of Letting Go, Guy Finley. He says, what's the first sign of a lurking hidden expectation you didn't know you had? And he calls it out. He said, it's pain. People don't do what we want. Things don't happen quickly enough. The weather doesn't cooperate. Our bodies don't cooperate. Why are these moments so painful? Because our minds are focused on a static, unchanging, me-centric picture while the dynamic unfolding of a broader life continues around us. And I'm, I'm sure we see that on social media and other things. There's all sorts of things that are going to make you feel bad if you aren't having that same thing. And Guy Finley goes on to say, there's nothing wrong with expectations per se, as it's appropriate to set goals and work properly towards their fruition. But the instant we feel pain over life not going our way, our expectations have clearly taken an improper turn. Any moment you feel resistance or pain, look for and then let go of that hidden expectation. Practice giving yourself over to what you don't want. Let that line at the store be long. Let the other person interrupt you. Let the nervousness make you shake. Be where your body is, not where your mind is trying to take you. I thought that was like a, a, a great reminder too. how many of us have been in the store at the grocery line, in the express lane, and the person has 18 items and it's a 10 item lane. You know, what are we going to do? Were you counting the six pack or not? I'm, that's what I always. <laughs> no, I'm not counting. I always wonder on those things: is six pack one or six? I never know. I, well, we wanted to uh, kind of wrap up this uh, this podcast uh, again. The whole idea behind this is is expectations is to make sure that if you have them, communicate them, set expectations that are going to be reasonable for both of you. Communicate those things. You only get in trouble when there's expectations that aren't shared. Right. And I'm going to leave you with this last thing from Jody Picault, one of our favorite authors. She says, there were two ways to be happy, improve your reality or lower your expectations. So we add a third one there to communicate your expectations. I promise, we promise it will really help. All right. Thanks so we much for being here on the Relationship Restaurant. This is podcast number 52. And we look forward to seeing you. Oh, one side note. Anna and um, Will Chase are podcast number 21 on the Relationship Restaurant. If you want more about love and money um, and how to get through those expectations about money. All right. Until next time. Thank you. Bye.